I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Pat from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. One of the largest tank battles in history in 1943 in World War II resulted in the Soviet Union gaining the initiative on the Eastern Front, which it would hold until the end of the war. And our song Panzerkampf became one of the most unexpected Sabaton popular songs we ever did. The Panzerkampf was fought between the Wehrmacht and the Red Army, and here's the story behind it. The Russian counter-offensives that had begun in November 1942 had pushed the Germans not only mostly out of the Caucasus, but also crossed into eastern Ukraine and southern Belarus. By March 1943, they had created a large salient deep into the German front lines between the cities of Orel and Kharkov. This was the Kursk salient and was an obvious target for German high command. By cutting off the salient, they would not only shorten the front line, but also trap a large amount of Russian soldiers and material. Such a success would give the Germans time to rebuild after the recent losses at Stalingrad. Both the forces of Army Group South, led by General Feldmarschall Erich von Manstein, and those of Army Group North, under General Oberst Walter Model, were to perform a massive pincer movement that would smash through on both sides of the salient and encircle the troops inside. But many German generals expressed doubts. See, the Russian army of 1943 was not the same army they so easily outmaneuvered in 1941. By now, the Soviets were much more competent in using their deep battle doctrine, and they were already preparing a summer offensive to use the salient to their own advantage, since they also knew of the German plans. The British had cracked the German ciphers and given intel to the Soviets, so Stavka, Russian high command, had convinced Stalin to delay the Soviet offensive until after the Germans had exhausted their own against the Russian defenses. Then the Soviet counteroffensive would easily punch through the German lines and collapse the whole army group center. So, tens of thousands of Russian workers began building an enormous defense in depth system, digging trenches and tank traps on 5,000 kilometers of front line. The defense was centered mostly on strong points manned by rifle battalions. Each also had four 4.5 centimeter anti tank guns. Russian pioneers lay up to a million mines all around the salient, both anti personnel and anti tank mines. Mostly, in front of their forward line. Red Army General Konstantin Rokoshovsky had also a strong mobile defense force that would engage the Germans if they managed to penetrate the front lines. All in all, the Soviet forces enjoyed at least a two to one advantage in men, tanks, artillery, and aircraft. Von Manstein disregarded those numbers since he still believed in the inferior quality of the Soviet troops. Model was less optimistic and very much against the whole operation, but despite his doubts, Adolf Hitler and German high command urged him to concentrate all his forces and attack from the north. Model, however, prepared for a possible Russian counterattack and held the second Panzer Armee around the city of Orel in reserve. He also prepared the Hagenstellung, a defensive line the Germans could fall back on if everything went to hell. On July 5th, 1943, the German offensive began. Okay, it actually began with a Soviet artillery barrage that rained down on the German front lines. See, the day before, captured German soldiers had revealed the exact hour the offensive would begin, so tactical surprise was lost. Still, the German forces were soon moving toward the Russian lines 
under their own opening barrage of heavy artillery, mortars, and naval Werfer rockets. As usual, the advance was spearheaded by the German tank divisions and mobile Sturm divisions, but the minefields and the Soviet resistance slowed them down. However, the Germans had sent new weapon systems into the battle. Ferdinand tank destroyers could outrange their Russian counterparts, and German pioneers led radio-controlled demolition tanks into the minefields to clear the path. Well-positioned Tiger tanks could destroy whole groups of Russian tanks that were sent out in premature counterattacks. In the air, the superior German FW-190As were able to suppress the Russian fighter and bomber attacks, despite their disadvantage in numbers. So, as the days dragged on, the German advance took out several major strongpoints, and they even penetrated the first line of Rokosovsky's defenses. But the large defensive system slowly but steadily whittled away the German forces. Tanks were damaged by the mines, and the relentless Russian artillery caused heavy casualties among the German infantry. German tank losses weren't actually as high as Russian sources may suggest. Only around 10% of Modal's tanks were lost, for example. The others took light damage, mostly to their tracks, which could usually be repaired in the field. Nonetheless, the Soviets achieved what they hoped for. They blunted the German spear, all while the Russian tank armies were building up for their own killing blow. On the 11th of August, Modal finally called off the fruitless offensive. Only the elite SS Panzer Divisions Totenkopf, Das Reich, and Leibstandarte in the south were still making progress as they reached the fields near a small village called Prokhorovka. The Stavka wanted to attack now, before Modal could redeploy his panzers. The long-awaited counterattack, Operation Kutuzov, would set loose the Russian tank armies. Early in the morning of the 12th, Operation Kutuzov began. the south, those SS Panzer divisions were surprised by a wave of armor that was heading their way. Some 500 tanks that attacked the unprepared Germans. The backbone of the Russian tank force was the upgraded T-34-76 model, which made around 70% of the tanks. But most of the rest was made out of light tanks. Only a few heavy KV tanks were there. The Germans had far fewer tanks, not even 300, but... Those SS divisions were the first to receive the Tiger and Panther models that outclassed the T-34 in range and whose armor could not be penetrated by the lighter tanks. And yet, in larger groups, the T-34 was still extremely dangerous. The tanks clashed on the fields of Prokhorovka. The German tanks desperately fought off the Soviet tanks at point-blank range. German Panzer Grenadiers even resorted to ramming them with their half-tracks. Despite heavy losses, though, the Soviets forced the Germans to retreat. In the north, the counteroffensive began with a massive artillery strike, obliterating much of the German forward positions of the Second Panzer Armee. The Soviet counterattack here would be even more deadly than in the south. Modal's foresight had paid off, and the Second Panzer Armee was able to fend off the first wave of Russian tanks attacking towards Orel. But this was just the initial engagement. The overwhelming Russian artillery and armor soon broke into the German positions all over the front and Modal was forced to pull back just to prevent encirclement without even waiting for authorization from Hitler. However, the Soviets failed to exploit their advantage nor realize how close the German defenses were to collapsing. So the Germans managed a fighting retreat. As the Red Army captured the major prize of Orel on August 5th, the German army retreated into their Hagen position. And it was that which ultimately saved them. German high command was now forced to face the fact that the German army was not able to fight high intensity battles on such a large scale any longer. 
the offensive had been a disaster. For not only did it not bring victory, it cost the German army the strategic initiative on the Eastern Front, and they would never regain it. The offensive had cost the Russians dearly, yes, and losses were perhaps four times higher than those of the Germans, but the Russians could replace their losses, which the Germans by this time could not. The Russians were on the offensive for good. Now, Panzerkampf is from the album Art of War, but it was not one of the singles or anything, right? No. Um, it was very interesting that we didn't believe so much in the song Panzerkampf initially. Okay. And uh, there were so many songs that we felt that were more stronger on the Art of War album. Even though this uh, album is now over 10 years, yeah. this uh, specific song can climb to the position number one of all Sabaton songs. Panzerkampf! Why do you suppose that is? What is it about it that you think resonates with people? I think that the song represents a lot that is Sabaton. Right. It has a huge scale battle. Tanks. Ah. More tanks. And even more tanks. And <laughs> most tanks. Uh, a lot of our fans, this is what they want to hear about. Also, it has the power, the sing-along things. Yeah. Very powerful chorus. It, thinking even back before that, when you guys wrote the song, was it written to be a typical Sabaton song with tanks and stuff? Or was it some, were you specifically thinking about that battle? We were specifically thinking about that battle because all the songs on the Art of War represents one of the chapters in the scripts. Right. The Art of War. The Sabaton album, The Art of War, is named after one of the world's classic pieces of literature. It is traditionally attributed to the ancient Chinese military leader Sun Tzu, though some of it likely dates from before his time. It's roughly two and a half thousand years old, and though it is ancient military strategy, it is in many ways timeless and has applications beyond the military, such as in business, law, and even sports. This is because its 13 chapters do not only deal with things like waging war or incendiary attacks, but also include the use of spies, identifying weak spots, and strategic planning. Basically, winning the fight without having to engage in battle, outsmarting your opponent. It is required reading for executives at many Japanese companies, is recommended reading for all U.S. military intelligence personnel, was widely studied by the KGB, and Bill Belichick, head coach of the NFL's New England Patriots, who just won their record sixth Super Bowl under him, has used the lessons of the art of war in his strategic preparations for football games. Again, one of the most influential texts in history. That was Panzerkampf, chapter number nine from The Art of War. See you next week on the Sabaton History Channel. All right, everyone. Remember to subscribe to Sabaton History, the regular Sabaton channel. Check out World War II and Time Ghost as well, all right? Right here, we got a playlist. More videos like this. It's good. You want to click this. And also, remember to support us on Patreon. That's what makes things like this happen. Take care and see you on the road.